At this time, I'd like to turn the podium over to Peter Levitt for yet another distinguished award that ASLO bestows on the community, and he will take it from here. Hi, folks. Uh, morning. I'm sure you're missing my brown jacket as much as I am, but uh, you've <clears throat> the Americans in the audience have had worries about transition teams. This is a transition shirt. Uh, we're, we're, uh, next time we'll talk, that is me and all of you, uh, we'll be in Hawaii at the Ocean Sciences meeting in 2014. Between now and then, though, we're going to have a call for award nominations again, and I just want to finish off by reviewing briefly what, what we're looking for. Um, remember that uh, the, the award process is pretty simple. You can put, it, put them in at any time. In fact, it's encouraged to put them in at any time. Uh, but I'll send out a reminder, sort of late August, early September, and then uh, sort of let you know that the deadline will be in mid-October. So the nomination process is, is dead simple. All you've got to do is write a two to three page nomination letter, get one, uh, two or three letters of support, bundle them together. We've got the website all set up submit them and, and you're off and running. Um, the awards remain, generally the rewards remain active for about three years. There are some exceptions, but we'll let you know if the, the, uh, the award nomination needs to be refreshed. And uh, there's awards for just about every aspect of our society. There's three career awards. There's the Yent Schindler, which is sort of zero to 12 years post PhD. The Hutchinson, which takes off from there and goes to approximately 25 years post PhD or late, late degree. And then the Redfield, which is the, the sort of the Career Achievement Award. Similarly, there's Young Influential Paper and More Mature Influential Paper Awards, the Lindemann and the Martin. There's an Applied Award, the Patrick Award. And then we have today's award, which is probably, well, arguably, one of the most important ones, uh, which is for education. So <clears throat> in thinking about what to say here, I, I, I thought about, well, what makes a good educator? And I think it's somebody that, that can bring passion and compassion, integrity, communication, and insight to the process. Now, I think we've all got a different mix and, and, and different skill sets so that we don't all have to do all these things tremendously to, to be a good educator, but we all have components of it in our activities. How we choose to express those uh, skills, though, varies a lot among people. Uh, some are, are uh, great undergraduate educators, inspire people to go on to careers. Some inspire those in graduate school to become uh, superior uh, scientists. Some people get involved in the political process and educate uh, our governance bodies. Some write books to generate interest in, in the entire process. And uh, some do an enormous amount of outreach by educating and helping people who can't help themselves. The thing about the 2013 Ramon Margalev Award is that our winner does all of this. It's truly remarkable, the degree and the depth and the passion that he brings to the education process. Uh, Warwick Vincent is the 2013 Margalev Award winner, and uh, his letter of nomination just makes so many interesting points. The success of his uh, trainees, he's got postdoctoral fellows, 17 postdoctoral fellows, many of whom, whom went on to uh, become faculty, several of which went into governance so that they decided that science was so important it should be part of the governing process. He's been inspirational in the undergraduate, his letters from his undergraduates, uh, well in French they were uh, simplement comme professeur, il est incroyable, formidable, simplement le meilleur. He's incredible, formidable, simply the best. Um, He's uh, edited or written 13 books. I don't think I've read 13 books in the last couple of years, <laughs> sadly. Um, he's uh, consulted with the Canadian govern government and as a member of the Royal Society of Canada, he's often called upon to get involved in large, high profile and very important activities that help change and shape uh, the Canadian society. Uh, in addition, his uh, undergraduate teaching is, is r remarkable, uh, particularly because he takes students out and, and, and lets them learn about limnology by doing. And finally, I think the thing that I, I found most inspirational is he's been uh, un unbelievably involved in helping uh, First Nations in uh, Northern Canada. This goes uh, to providing them with information through a free access Arctic net, 
which he developed, as well as developing an actual science centre in northern communities where people can go and learn about science in their community without having to go to the south. So with that, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Warwick Vincent, the 2013 Ramon Margulov Award winner. Wow, thanks so much for that, Peter. I really feel underdressed this morning, actually. Thanks, uh, thanks to Peter, uh, thanks to your committee. Oh, I feel at home now, thanks. And uh, uh, thanks so much to, to ASLO for the honor of, of this award. And uh, thank you also to the nominators, who I need to say a little bit more about later on. So the, the theme of this talk is education. And if I can get the slides up here, that's better. Right, here comes Michael F. So I borrowed part of my title, actually most of my title, from a man by the name of Richard Feynman, a theoretical physicist, a Nobel Prize winner. And he was, like Margalev, he was a, and is, a tremendous source of, of inspiration to us as a teacher, as well as a researcher. And, and Feynman, in fact, he said he needed to teach that, uh, and for a variety of reasons, he said that teaching was a test of the state of knowledge in the, in the research field that we're involved in. And, it, and the story goes that one time he was asked by one of his colleagues to uh, explain about subatomic particles and why they followed a particular statistical distribution function. And he said, no problem, I'll give you an introductory lecture on this. And he went away and, he, and a few days later he came back, he said, you know, I really can't do it. I can't reduce what we know about this to an undergraduate course. I can't reduce it to a, to a freshman level. And that means we really don't know enough about that subject. And I think that makes sense to us as, uh, as aquatic scientists. Because uh, when we're working with our grad students on those manuscripts, you know, version number 12, and uh, we're working, uh, putting together a class uh, for our undergrads, or we're doing a preparing a public lecture, we're constantly asking ourselves, you know, what, what is it that we know about this subject and what is it that we understand, what is it we think we understand? And uh, we're constantly testing ourselves and that's a, that's a powerful, continuous learning experience. So Feynman uh, talks here about his, uh, his freshmen uh, as undergrads, but I suspect if you were a student at whatever level with Feynman, you had to work pretty darn hard to keep up with him. And uh, even for those topics that were crystal clear for Richard Feynman. And that was true for Ramon Margalef as well. I had the, the good fortune to first meet uh, Professor Margalef uh, when, when I was doing my PhD in Charles Goldman's group at the University of California at Davis. And so uh, Professor Margalef came, came across to California. Uh, he gave a very interesting talk. And there were some concepts that were immediately clear, but there were others that were deeper and more complex and more puzzling. And you had to wrap them up in your mind and take them home and carefully unwrap them and keep thinking about them. And so, as a grad student, after having the chance of, of talking with uh, Margalef after, after his uh, lecture, I went back to one of his books, actually this little volume on the left here called Perspectives in, Ecology, Perspectives in Ecological Theory. It's a very short book, it's just over 100 pages long, but it's incredibly concentrated. And it's, it was actually based on a set of lectures that he, he delivered at the University of California, at the University of Chicago, sorry. Uh, and my, my copy of that book ended up pretty worn out because I packed it everywhere with me and read it from cover to cover uh, a number of times for two reasons. One is I, I really wanted to understand more about some of those concepts that he was developing. 
and also because I had my doctoral prelim exam coming up and I wanted to retain at least one intelligent thing that I might be able to say during that exam. And this, this book is tremendously inspirational because it talks about lakes and oceans as systems, uh, as coupled systems, the pelagic environment in particular and the plankton and, and, and not only in, in, in terms of feedbacks and, and fluxes and not only in terms of mass and energy and momentum but also as information systems, evolving information centers. He, he, br he brought in concepts from cybernetics and from information theory, and he considered the plankton as an evolving system of information content, and that determined by its information, by its uh, taxonomic richness. And it's interesting, today we're coming back to this in, uh, in molecular microbial ecology. We're especially interested in the in, in that message, that RNA, the genomic richness of that message and its transcription and its translation into proteins and uh, their roles, what those proteins are doing via organisms and consortia networks of microbes in the functioning of ecosystems and in the functioning of the biosphere. So, so for me, it's just a tremendous and uh, humbling honor to uh, receive this award, a award that, uh, that commemorates one of my superheroes in, uh, in teaching and research, Professor Ramon Magalev. Another reason that uh, this is such a great honor for me is that I was nominated, as Peter has said, uh, by uh, my, my students and past and present, and, and the majority of them are Francophones. That is, French is their first language. And what that suggests to me is that maybe I've now been forgiven for all my accidental injuries to the French language. Uh, this is the, the language that I had to learn when I moved to Quebec City uh, uh, in 1990. Uh, Laval University is a francophone university in French Canada in, in Quebec. And when I think about those poor undergraduates, my first few years when I started my teaching with my strange explanations of limnology because they were so constrained by a very small vocabulary, and that coupled with uh, an even stranger Kiwi French accent. I mean, the, it's really those students who deserve the, the, the Margalef Award. It's uh, those poor students. And it, and it made me also very understanding of the challenges that non native English speakers face uh, as, as they develop and, and learn to uh, develop their careers as a publishing scientist, and something probably we need to increasingly address in, in ASLO. But Somehow, uh, remarkably, uh, my uh, French students um, survived this process, and I got a little better, and I learned a little more French and as a result of this immersion in teaching, and it, and it is such a beautiful language. But what came as a surprise to me, totally unexpected, is that suddenly, as a result of this, I could access some of the, fi the founding documents of limnology. And I could f have fun with some of this work in my teaching. And the reason for that is the man who first described the science of limnology is this gentleman. And almost none of his work is available in English. As many of you well know, this man's name is Francois Forel. Uh, he was a teaching professor at the Academy of Lausanne on the shores of Lake Geneva uh, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. And I've got to say that here in this watercolor painting on the right here, he looks very relaxed. And, and but in fact, this man was an industrious scholar, uh, very productive. Over the course of his career, he produced 286 publications. And one of them was in three volumes and 1,900 pages long. <laughs> And all of these uh, publications were exclusively in French, uh, with, one ex with one exception. Uh, Farrell produced the first textbook in limnology that you can see down here. Uh, in fact, he wrote that in French, and then he got a friend of his to translate it all into German. I don't think any of my friends would do that for me, but he, uh, he published that in German. It's never been published in English. And that's really too bad that more of this work is not accessible because Farrell had so many visionary things to say about lakes and lake ecosystems and limnology. He made fundamental contributions to our understanding of 
physics, for example, lake physics, uh, stratification, mixing, density, currents, uh, underflows, uh, convection, uh, hydrologic optics. He was very interested in the penetration of photochemically active radiation, and he came up with a technique to measure that uh, using photographic plates that he installed in the lake. Uh, he was fascinated by uh, the color of natural waters and the information that you might be able to obtain from that color of natural waters. And he had many insights into uh, biological aspects of lakes, ecological aspects, aspects of lakes. For example, on the Benthos, uh, he was a, uh, a fantastic collaborator. He often uh, he worked with many people throughout the world. He was a great networker. He would have loved Facebook and Google Docs. Uh, his work included insights into plankton ecology, invasive species, dissolved organic carbon, and microbial processes. So my interest in uh, Farrell eventually took me to Switzerland and uh, Lake Geneva. And there I've had the privilege of meeting some of Farrell's descendants, including, uh, I don't know whether you can see her there, a uh, wonderful lady uh, on the left. This is just before Christmas of last year. Uh, her name is Jacqueline, and she is the granddaughter of Farrell. Uh, and we're standing there outside the family home. We're in the 19th century and early 20th century. Francois Farrell worked here on the shores of Lake Geneva. And in fact, where just two years ago, up here in the attic, the, uh, the great-grandson of uh, Farrell was going through the family archives and found a manuscript that had been lost in the family archives for 100 years. <laughs> and so they pulled that out, and it's a, the manuscript's all about Farrell's uh, life as a student, his teaching, uh, his research career, and his development of the science of limnology. And it's just been published in December 2012 uh, in French, but hopefully in English uh, uh, eventually. So the moral of that story is never throw anything out, especially those manuscripts. There are many aspects of Farrell's approach that I like and that we talk about in my limnology classes. And, and one of those is the intimate relationship between human beings and lakes and the value of lakes for their ecosystem and geosystem services. Because he never used those terms, but that's really what he was talking about and that he, when he described the importance of lakes in terms of aesthetics, uh, in terms of uh, safe drinking water, uh, transport. He even quantified one of those ecosystem services, the, the uh, fishery of Lake Geneva, in, uh, in precise units of Swiss francs. And his attitude was not humans against the lake, but rather we're in the ecosystem. It's us, it's not us versus the ecosystem, where uh, he considered human beings as a component part. We're, we're in this together. We're part of the, the solution. And that's uh, an attitude that I find resonates really well with our students today as we uh, uh, are involved in our teaching of limnology and oceanography. Here's a, a section of uh, one of uh, Farrell's manuscripts. Actually, it's from volume three of his monograph, his handwritten manuscript for his monograph on limnology. And he's, uh, he's listing the plants and animals of the ecosystem of Lake Geneva. And he starts here with the fauna. And uh, he's classifying the first taxon that he puts at the top of his species list for Lake Geneva. And the colors he's using there are messages to the typesetter for the different levels of, of, of subjects. And what he says is vertebrates, mammals, primates, long man, homo sapiens. And he says man, homo sapiens, is not an essentially aquatic species, but his activities make him an erratic species in the fauna of the lake. And today, uh, and he goes on to say how man exerts more than any other animal a powerful influence on the natural environment and all living things around him. And we've heard from Jim this morning some incredibly compelling examples of exactly to that. But today, uh, here in the 21st century, those words from Francois Farrell ring truer than ever. Uh, with my graduate students and postdocs at, uh, at Laval University, our, our research is mostly up in the high northern latitudes. We work up in the, in the subarctic and in the Arctic. And it's, uh, this is the region where global climate models, global circulation models suggest that 
These will receive as a result of human emissions, emissions of greenhouse gases the greatest effects of climate change and the most rapid effects. And consistent with that prediction, we are now seeing in front of our eyes incredibly rapid change, dramatic change. Uh, here's one of the lakes that we work on. Uh, this is uh, it's the, uh, the northernmost lake up in the high Arctic of, of Canada. It's called Ward Hunt Lake. And back in the, uh, the 1950s, this had an average ice cover of about 4.3 meters. And so that, that's very similar, actually, to uh, ice caps that we see on lakes in the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica. But over uh, the last few decades, we've seen a substantial change in, in that ice cover. Uh, and particularly the last decade, uh, suddenly a, a massive loss of that ice. And over the last two years, in fact, uh, that lake has been completely free of ice. And when you witness the speed of these changes that are taking place in these sentinel ecosystems of planet Earth, you realize how vulnerable other ecosystems around the world must be, such as the McMurdo Dry Valley Lakes, for example. This climate change in the Arctic, uh, coupled with uh, the social impacts of the modern world, are having a particularly strong effect on Aboriginal peoples who have lived in these high northern latitudes for millennia. And there are so many challenges that uh, these young people are facing. Uh, it's, it's a very young age population. The birth rate's very high. The average age in uh, these communities is mid-20s. 35% of the Canadian Inuit population is 14 years of age or younger. And these people are facing a uh, uh, wide range of different challenges. The, the, the uh, school dropout rate uh, is extremely high, typically in excess of 50%, uh, often in excess of 80%. And there's a real need for alternate forms and supplements to education. So we, we feel as researchers and as educators from the South, we really need to lend a hand to that process. So as one approach towards that, we've just built uh, and inaugurated just last year, actually, uh, what we're calling a community science center. Uh, it's at this village at the mouth of the Great Whale River, uh, which discharges out into Hudson Bay. And this is a place that is experiencing extremely rapid change, climate change, unprecedented, we think, for millennia. Uh, we're seeing limnological change, oceanographic change, and there are also many social challenges being faced as well. So we've put together a building there associated with our research station. It's, uh, uh, it's a building that includes uh, many uh, environmental technologies. We're using it as an experiment as well to test out new techniques for the north, uh, solar technologies, uh, site restoration with native plants, for example. But we've also been working with the northern communities, with the, the First Nations and with the Inuit, to incorporate symbols and uh, I ideas from, from their cultures. So, for example, this, this teepee that you can see here, what that symbol says is that here in the far cold north, this Santa is a warm place, and we have food. So come on in, welcome. And uh, we're now working with these, uh, these schools and doing fun things with the students and their teachers in science uh, with the Inuit schools and, and uh, Cree First Nation schools. And in that teaching, we are finding things out. We are finding things out about uh, the challenges, the aspirations and challenges of the, northern, of the northerners, uh, rich cultures. We're pushing our abilities to connect. And of course, this is, a, this is a work in progress, and we're still at a very early and naive stage. We have a huge amount to learn, but I really hope that we can convey some of our enthusiasm for science uh, outside the classroom. Of course, I think every kid should be a limnologist, but I, maybe I'm, I'm a little bit biased and not totally objective, but I really hope that we can make a difference. So I should, uh, I should wrap up here. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank again the many people who have helped me enormously in my own learning. Uh, firstly, the sources of inspiration, such as Ramon Margalef, who combined research and education and taught us about the value of that convergence. Secondly, my nominators, uh, my students in the past, uh, present, and, and in the future. Uh, thanks for uh, continuing to motivate me and to teach me. And, uh, Thanks again for your language forgiveness, and please keep it up. 
I thank ASLO for the honor of this award and uh, the many people who keep its committees, publications and meetings on track. I have a special debt of gratitude that I need to pass on to my professor, Charles R. Goldman. Thanks so much there, Charles, is here with us today. Uh, Charles has actually won many awards for teaching as well as research, and he brought me into contact with just such an amazing group of scientists, uh, the, the extended Goldman family of students and many friends. And one of those friends today is Professor Michio Kumagai, who I've worked with for 20 years, and uh, he was co-convener last year at Lake Biwa. Thank you, Michio, for everything you keep uh, teaching me. I'm sorry you have to deal with such a slow student. Sumimasen, Michio-san. And lastly, but uh, certainly not least, I thank my wife, Honey Lovejoy, who continues, as always, to be my best collaborator. So thanks very much for listening, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Peter. Can I take my polar bear with me? And the polar bear, yes. <laughs> Thank you.